We wave high the flag of freedom as a patriotic reminder to never take our independence for granted. Fireworks explode into the night sky, lighting up the darkness, reminding us of our nation's calling in the world. One nation under God. We look into the sky and remember that for all the freedom we have to celebrate, we must never forget our dependence on God. It was by His hand we were afforded our independence. So we might stand for liberty, remembering He set us free from the bondage of sin. So we might stand for justice, for the Lord loves justice, and He will not forsake His saints. So we might stand for freedom, because we know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We thank you, God, for the beautiful gift of our country. May we always depend on you to sustain us. Well, good morning, new community, those of you that are gathered here, those of you that are gathered at home, so great to be called to freedom. God did not create us to be in bondage, but to enjoy freedom in him. So I pray that you would stand this morning and we would sing together that there will be no uh, restraint internally and certainly no persecution externally as we give glory to God. Why don't you clap your hands this morning as we give glory to him. He deserves the highest praise. All right, we're all the worship team this morning, all right? So let's sing together. There's a song that soared my lips From the moment that I rise To the one who rescued me and brought me to life Praise awaits you at the dawn Praise awaits you Glory be to God, the Father, glory be to God, the Son, glory be to God, the Spirit, all glory to the One, glory to the Lord, Almighty, glory to the King, most high, glory be
so together we give glory to him we amplify his praise let his praise resound in this place this morning let's sing of his one great love oh for a thousand tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise so let's lift up our voices this morning let's join in this one great chorus All right, let's voice. Let's, let's sing again. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God assist me to proclaim, to spread through all
Each and every one of us have been recipients of that love. God, God has poured out his love on us. Um, and as the ushers prepare to come forward and receive the offering, you know, whether we have little or whether we have much, we give. Whether we're feeling great or maybe we're experiencing discouragement, sadness, heartache, regret, regardless of, of, of any of those factors, we praise. I should even say in the midst of those factors, we praise. I want to read a scripture. We're going to be um, reading from Psalm 42 during the message. I want to share two verses with you. Verse 5 and verse 8. It says, New Living Translation, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I've asked those questions before. Maybe you have as well. Here's the response. I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again my Savior, and my God. As I stand up before you, I have to choose each Sunday. I'm going to praise him again. I'm not going to rest on last Sunday's praise. I'm going to praise him again because he's my Savior and he's my God. Verse 8, but each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me, and through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. So as the Lord pours his unfailing love upon us each day. We pour out our lives in praise to him. So I encourage you as we sing together, as we worship together, as we give in our offering, let's remember that everything that we have, everything that we are, is from, as a gift from him. So we give it back to him in worship, no matter what you're experiencing. Here it is. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. The streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. No matter what we face, blessed be his name. Blessed be your name. When I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Let's praise him again. Say every blessing you pour out. Closes in boy, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. Sun shining down on me when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. This pain in the offering. Still blessed be your name. Let's declare this together. Oh, oh, oh. 
name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Bless your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Feel free to grab a seat. It's uh, so good to be together to worship. I, I'm going to pray for our message in a minute, but I want to start with a couple uh, introductory comments. Um, as I'm sure you know, uh, about 10 days ago, Roe v. Wade was overturned. 50-year-old, <laughs> it's a 50-year-old legal standing that said that uh, in the Constitution was the right to have an abortion. And now that overruling has pushed it back to the state level. So this isn't a ban on abortion that's happened. Um, although many states have had uh, trigger laws put in effect that will go into effect over the number of weeks and months to come. Um, but largely it will restrict access to abortion services uh, at the state level. And I thought at a time like this, it would be worth just reminding us of some priorities of God and some priorities of this church. Let me read for you. It's in our statement of faith, you can find it on our webpage, our statement on sanctity of life. It reads like this. It says, all human life is sacred and created by God in his image. Human life is of inestimable worth in all its dimensions, including pre-born babies, the aged, the physically and mentally challenged, and every other stage or condition from conception through natural death. We are therefore called to defend, protect, and value all human life. So where life is defended and protected and valued, it's a good day. It's a day to be glad. But in light of that, I want to also remind us of just a few things that are really important to God, obviously, as this. And I do so as me, a white upper middle class male. <laughs> I don't apologize for who I am. And for who I am both uh, enables me to say what I'd say about this and limits me in certain ways. I've never uh, faced the reality or potential of carrying a life in my own body. I've never uh, faced many of the hardships and stresses that lead people towards choosing uh, to end a pregnancy. But I say this as a pastor who is often asked about what I think about important things. And so here's a few things that I think we ought to remember in light of this momentous decision, things that are really important to God. First is that God has always placed a priority on life. There was a time when life didn't exist. It was darkness and void, and God, in his grace and mercy, created life. And so it's his to deal with. The church has valued life, both for the born and the unborn, throughout its history. And therefore, it's often gone against what culture thought was okay. Back in uh, the times of Jesus, unwanted babies were often left uh, out for exposure, a way of um, handling babies that weren't... Uh, um, didn't, families didn't feel like they could care for, and uh, Christians stood against that. They saw children as uh, having worth. You can think of the words of Jesus, let the little children come to me. And so when laws change that protect lives, young lives, unborn lives, lives of children, it is a day to be glad. It's also a time to remember that God has always stood up for those on the underside of power, the weak and the vulnerable, the disenfranchised, the poor, the widow, the orphan, and women. And there are ways in which pregnancies like that will be seen through now can fall on those on the underside of power, those maybe most under-resourced to care for those lives. And so as a church, we try not to just think the right things. We try to do the right things. So throughout our history, we've supported organizations like Women's Choice Network that helps women choose to see a pregnancy through. We've supported things like Gregory's Gift, who helps fund adoptions. And even just a few weeks ago, I was in West Virginia with many of you, uh, rebuilding the kitchen for a foster mom who helps uh, care for um, kids uh, that are special needs in the foster care system in a place where the foster care system is wildly under-resourced. And as I, oh, and every week you come in and sit in this room, you're around people that either have adopted or have fostered or have been fostered or adopted. So we have some real heroes among us. And so we need to remember all these things, but we also need to remember that in every priority the church has ever held, every ethic, every moral, it's done so inconsistently. Um, 
everything we've stood for as a church at large, you can find instances of compromise. And so, again, rather than just trying to think the right things in a moment like this, it's really time to act. And in light of how the church, in many ways, has had a corporate failure to stand up for what it really believes, in light of this decision, it's really a time to remember grace. Every person finds salvation, that finds salvation, finds it by grace. In spite of our sin, in spite of our being enemies of God, God, in his grace and mercy, looked on the life of Jesus and saved us. And so the leaders of the church and actually everyone in it has one thing in common. We're all sinners saved by grace. And so it's a time like this where it's easy to think about those people. Those people who stand on either side of this issue. And uh, the reality is that as we think about those people, how they think and what they do is never as simple as we make it out to be. Decisions like the ones that we have in our minds this morning, they're never made lightly. They're made through tears and pain and doing one's best to either live life in the best way possible or at least do the least wrong thing that you can. And so grace reminds us uh, that those people find their way into the kingdom the same way that we do. And lastly, this issue may hit you at a far more personal level than I would ever know. You may be someone who's chosen to have an abortion or been part of one, and it is a day to remember grace for you as well. That there is no condemnation in Christ. Jesus put shame to death, and his grace is sufficient. So though it's a day to celebrate and be glad, it's also a day to remember all the breadth of what's important to God. That remembering these things is a call not just to celebrate, but a call to act and to dig in and support the causes that are near and dear to Christ's heart. So let me pray for us and we'll dive into uh, the message. Father, we give you thanks for any instance like this where lives will be protected. And God, as we'll see in a moment as we look at this psalm, every time that we remember what's important to you is a time to act. And so God, may we not just hold the right opinions and think the right things, but may we live the right kind of lives and dig in and give sacrificially to causes that protect lives. And so God, help us agents, make us agents of your kingdom to stand up for the things that really matter for you and to do so even at great cost to ourselves. Be with us now in these moments as we seek to do uh, that with your word, to take it seriously and implement it into our lives. God, we trust that your spirit's here with us, that you will speak to us through your word. We give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, we're uh, going to continue on in our series in the Psalms. I, I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember, the end game of this series is to help inform our lives of prayer. We've seen the ideas of reflecting about God and his character. We've seen rejoicing about God and his character. We've, Joel last week talked about repenting of our sin. And this morning, we're going to learn to remorse. We're going to look at Psalms 42 and 43. They kind of go together in one unit. We'll only get to look at a handful of verses in them. But they will talk about remorsing. Now, technically, if you looked this up in a commentary, they'd call these Psalms of Lament. But that didn't start with an R, so I had to change it for our purpose is this morning. Now, when you see someone lamenting in the Psalms, you'll see them lamenting about a couple different things. One, they may lament about their own heart, that they feel like they've fallen short, that they've done wrong things. They may be lamenting about the injustice of the world. They may even be lamenting about God, whether he acted in a way they didn't like or he failed to act how they wished. And so when we see the psalmist lamenting, we will see real, honest prayers, raw and unfiltered. And in many ways, these are some of the most helpful psalms for us to digest because they speak to how we often find ourselves when we feel like God isn't there or has fallen short and we need him. See, I think we'll learn today that honesty is really valued in prayer. So we're going to look at an honest prayer where the psalmist is remorsing. And we're going to learn to do two things. should be simple. It's only two, right? How hard could it be? We're going to learn to pour and to put. It's all you've got to remember today, plus all the 18 sub points for each of those, but it's fine. <laughs> we're going to learn to pour and to put. So we'll look at Psalm 42 together. It starts with an introduction that reads like this. For the director of music, a mascal to the sons of Korah. 
See, this psalm is given this introductory note. You often see them at the beginning of the psalms to orient us to what's going on, who is in mind, who wrote it, and uh, what the purpose of it is. Some translations actually say it's to the director of music, and some say it's for. So it might be the director of music himself writing, or it might be a message written to him. And a maskal is this, uh, it's, it's really tough actually to translate. It's one of those words in the scriptures that's hard to really pin down, but it roughly means a wise teaching or a song. And these sons of Korah that are writing this wise teaching or song were given responsibilities to lead worship in the temple. So just like think Matt Mason when you think uh, of the sons of Korah or Marianne or everybody that, that's up here. Now, it goes and starts in verse 1 like this. It says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Now, I've had this experience a couple times through this series where when I go to picture what is happening in the psalm, I picture it actually wildly differently than the psalm is intended to read. See, prior to this week, this is like a beautiful picture to me. I'm thinking of, you know, a happy and upbeat scene. I'm thinking of a deer who's been out frolicking in the woods, you know, playing it tag, bopping around with his friends, you know, all the woodland creatures just like going to and fro, loving life, living the dream, right? And maybe the deers, they're probably singing a little bit like they would, like, you know, Bambi style or uh, Cinderella style. And, uh, you know, after this wholesome activity, my image in my brain is Bambi finds the most picturesque stream, think like Thomas Kincaid painting, all right? And it just slakes up from this rushing stream. You know, probably between sips, it's high hooving, you know, it's friends, like, you know, way to go, good game out there. Maybe chest bumping. Picture deers doing that. That's weird, right? Now, that that's how I pictured it. You can get a sense of how easy my life has been. Um, but that's not what's going on here. Many commentators agree. This is not some moment of a deer having a grand old time and then finding everything it needs to slake its thirst. This is not a deer frolicking around. This is a deer who is dying of thirst and goes back to a stream that it's drank from a million times and it's empty. There's nothing there. This isn't, you know, getting Gatorade showers as a deer. This is someone dying of thirst, longing to find something that will sustain their lives, going back to the place where they've found it before and it's gone. This is a deer not celebrating a, you know, a run well run, but it is a deer fearing for its life. And the psalmist is trying to make the analogy obvious. He is the deer, and the stream he can't find is God. This is made even more clear in verse 2. It reads like this. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? See, he has drunk from the, from the stream of God's presence many times, but he can't find it now. And this isn't some superficial thirst that the deer, the psalmist, is experiencing. This isn't, oh, my throat's a little parched, my lips are a little dry. He's saying, all the way down to my soul, I am thirsty for God. I feel like I'm about to die because of the presence of God that I no longer can find. Down to his essence, he is thirsty and longing for God. Now, followers of God have faced this kind of problem all throughout the history of what it is to follow God. It's been called things like spiritual dryness, spiritual disorientation, a spiritual night or a dark night of the soul. We've talked about the dark night of the soul and surprisingly, so often these conditions where you just feel like God has left the building happen not to new or young or inexperienced Christians, but to mature Christians who have followed God for a long time. This is the state in your spiritual life where you feel destabilized, disoriented, disillusioned, deserted, and in a dark place. It's as old as Genesis 1, where before God intervened, it was darkness and void. Here's some biblical examples of people that have faced just this condition. Job was convinced that God had abandoned him, although God was right there all along. The Psalms obviously are filled with this kind of language that we'll see today, but it's in many places in the Psalms. The Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt uh, weathered 430 years of spiritual silence. For seven decades, they wandered around in uh, uh, the uh, darkness of exile. Uh, Jonah was literally swallowed up in the belly of a whale, experiencing physical darkness. And then when he got out, only to feel the spiritual darkness of having his message not received to its hearers. 
Even Mary and Martha, you can imagine what it felt like for them when they had beckoned for Jesus to come and save their brother, and he delayed, and Lazarus died. Historical Christians outside the Bible have experienced this. Literally, John of the Cross, a 16th century Christian, wrote the book called The Dark Night of the Soul while he's being tortured in captivity. C.S. Lewis experienced a dark night when his wife Joy painfully died from bone cancer, and he wrote about this in A Grief Observed in which he refers to God as a cosmic sadist, one who is unreasonable, vain, vindictive, unjust, and cruel. The words of C.S. Lewis. Oswald Chambers writes of this state. Lewis Meads, a famous Christian ethicist who taught at the seminary I went to, has wrote about this. Henry Nowen went through a dark night of the soul. Mother Teresa, for the last 50 years of her ministry to the poor and the sick and dying in India, said that she experienced for 50 years a profound interior suffering, lack of sensible consolation, spiritual dryness, an apparent absence of God from her life, and at the same time a painful longing for him. Eugene Peterson says that the absence of God was and is a common experience in the company of the saved. So if you've ever found yourself in that place where you feel like God's left the building, you don't know where he's gone, you keep going back to where he once was and you can't find him, you are in good company. This psalm's for you. But it's not just the saved that has experienced this. The Savior experienced this. Think of the words of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane where he says that his soul was so overwhelmed that he was on the verge of death. What did he say when he was on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This dark night, this reason to remorse is so common in the Christian life that it is so wonderful that God has left us guidance through it here. So if you find yourself in that position this morning, take heed and take heart and listen to how the psalmist navigates his way through what it is to remorse the absence of God goes on in verse 3. He says, my tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? He's writing quite colorfully about this, and he has people around him that aren't really helping all that much, because they are asking the same question he's asking, where is your God? Now, we don't know where his, uh, his peers are coming from. They may be coming from a place of unbelief. They may be saying something like, does God really even exist? But the psalmist is a believer. He is asking, where is my God from a place of belief? He believes that God is real. He just doesn't feel him. Objectively, he would say, does God exist? True. Is God with you right now? No idea. This is the state of the psalmist. He just has no felt sense of the presence of God. But he shifts into things that will help us navigate through this. So you get the picture? This is a guy who feels like God has left him, that he's going back to where he would found God before, and he can't find him. And he offers, as we see him process through this, some wonderful advice to how to navigate through this dark night that you may find yourself in right now. We start to get the answer in verse 4. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. The first thing he does is he pours out his soul. What's that look like? What does it mean to pour out your soul? See, I think the first thing we notice is that to pour out your soul means honest, unfiltered questions and conversation. Now, I don't know if you get a chance to pray a lot in public, but I do. I'm like the designated prayer wherever I go, with the one exception, my dinner table. My seven-year-old Micah always steals my thunder there. I'm happy to give it away, though. But I don't know, when you pray in public, and you have to pray out, have you ever prayed out loud, right? You're in a small group, and you know, I love at, just like calling people out, like pray out loud, and then you're like, meh. What often happens is, is you become painfully aware of what you're saying, and what happens is you, you self-edit. You start to think about what you're going to say. Does it sound good? Does it sound Christian-like? Does it sound like I'm a guy who prays a lot? And you start to think about how you're going to pray. So you have this wild self-consciousness. This is not what we see here. 
Because if we're honest, maybe we self-edit a lot out loud. But I've done a little reflecting over the past week. I've self-edited internally. Right? Have you ever been like by yourself, praying in silence? No one's going to hear it. And you feel some stuff about God. You were thinking things like, why did you do that? Or why didn't you do this? Or where have you gone? Or I want the kind of Christian experience that so-and-so has because they always seem like they're raising their hands and on fire in the Lord and all that kind of stuff. But you, you can't say that to God, can you? You can't say to God, where are you? You can't say to God, I'm furious at you. You can't say to God, you're dropping the ball. You can't say to God, if I were you, I'd do it differently. Can you? But here... We see as the psalmist pours out his soul, the gloves are off. He is not self-editing anymore. He is saying what he really thinks. He is disillusioned and dismayed, and he's making it known. Listen to some of the questions that show up in the psalms at large. We hear things like, why? How come? How long? That's not fair. Are you there? What were you thinking? Where were you? And when are you going to stop that? It couldn't be more honest than that. Those aren't self-edited prayers. Just in the psalm that we are looking at today, here's some questions if we were had time to go through all the verses. When can I go and meet with God? Where can I go and meet with God? Why am I downcast? Why am I disturbed? Why have you forgotten me? Why have you rejected me? And why must I go about mourning? It's not that long a psalm. And that's what the psalmist is asking. You tell me, if God wants your edited prayers or your honest reality, he can handle it. And in this psalm, we are seeing the psalmist saying, I don't even know what to do. I'm just going to say what's on my heart because I am in a bad spot. And what's wild is this isn't seen as some sinful psalm. This is actually prescriptive. This is how to do it. So if you ever find yourself editing your prayers... I warn you, I caution you, I encourage you, be honest with God. If we learn anything from this, we learn that we can be real with him. And I hope you have a group of close friends that you can be real with too, where you can just say where you are, say what's actually true and real about your life and what's going on with you and God. Pouring out your soul starts with this honest questioning of God. But the reality is, pouring out your soul isn't just hurling questions at God, it's actually asking yourself some tough questions too. Listen to verse five. It says, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. Now I mentioned this passage a couple weeks ago from Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones when I preached on Psalm one. So I'm not gonna quote it at length, but I wanna remind us of it. In that passage, he says that so often we talk to ourselves but he encourages us to listen to ourselves. But do you ever talk to yourself? You know, sometimes out loud if you're in the car, right? But always, if you were to attend to what's going on in your mind, you probably have some tape playing, something telling you about yourself and your life. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes you're the man, it's awesome, your brain's just high-fiving yourself. A lot of times, it's critical. I don't know if you're anything like me, but sometimes my brain is asking me, why did you do that? <laughs> why didn't you? Did you really say that? That's what you went with, bro? <laughs> I can't believe you even thought that. Everyone's going to notice you messed up. Everyone's going to think you're not as smart as you think you are. Everyone's going to know you're a fraud. He or she doesn't really love you, and everyone's going to find out who you really are. That is often the tape that is playing. And unfortunately, sometimes we believe it. One of my favorite quotes I came across in one of my years of study was this. Don't believe everything you think. <laughs> See, we always have the privilege to take our thoughts captive, like the Bible says, and put them out in front of us and ask them some questions. When we hear, hey, you're not all that great, we think, wait a second. Do I have to believe that? See, we live in a day and age where if you find it in here, in your head, or in here, in your heart, we just assume it must be true. But the Bible has a long track record of asking us to call into question even the stuff that we find in here and in here. That we don't always 
trust the things we think about ourselves and the world, and we shouldn't always trust the things we feel. Just because it's in here doesn't mean that it's true and we need to act on it. And so Lloyd-Jones says, rather than just listening to yourself, you're going to get yourself into real trouble if you don't talk back to yourself. If you don't grab those thoughts and ask them questions, that you don't interrupt that inner tape. See, the psalmist is in a place where his inner tape is deep and dark and sad. Right? Joel, is emo music still a thing? I don't know. Yeah, no one knows. We could Wikipedia it later or ask Jeeves or something. I don't know. Remember Ask Jeeves? The website? Anyways, my wife and I joke about that. What's not funny for everybody else? But um, So the psalmist is interrupting his own tape. And listen to what he does. He says, he's talking to himself. He says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So as he's pouring out his soul, as he's asking himself and God questions, he begins to do a second thing. He begins to put his hope in God. He commands himself. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. So what does putting your hope look like? We've looked a little bit of what does it look like to pour out your soul. What does putting your hope in God look like? First, it starts with this resolution. I will yet praise him. He doesn't stumble on it as an accident or a fluke or a fun coincidence. He decides that that's what he's going to do. I will yet praise him. No matter the circumstances, you have to remember that this psalm is being written in a dark night of the soul, in a place of destabilization, disorientation, disillusionment, desertion, in that dark place. And the psalmist is just plain down. Makes me think of the words of Job, where he says, though you slay me, yet I will praise you. The psalmist begins to put his hope in God by resolving about what he's going to be like. I will praise him. Now, we need to piece together what it is to have a notion of hope. That first is resolving this right course of action. But the second piece of what it is to hope is like trust. Every time you see the word hope in the Old Testament, it's the people of God trusting that God's going to come through. But what does that trust look like? Sometimes it looks like active engagement. I'm going to act in accordance with God's priorities because I know he's going to come through. But sometimes, and this is wild, if you, look at this, if you look at this verse where it says, put your hope in God, other people rightly translate it with these words, wait for God. If you looked it up in the NASB translation, a really good, quite literal translation, they won't say, put your hope in God. They will say, wait for God. Sometimes hoping looks like waiting. It looks like enduring. It looks like weathering. It looks like showing grit and perseverance, sometimes it looks like suffering. Sometimes hoping in God in a dark night of the soul simply means waiting for the light to break through. So hoping is trusting. Hoping is waiting. And hoping is remembering. It's remembering that God has the final say. But so often this hope has to contradict our experience. It has to contradict reality. Listen to the words in Romans 8, verses 24 and 25. It says, in this hope, um, we are saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we don't yet have, we wait patiently for it. See, sometimes hope says, when I look out the window, things don't look that great. But I know that God has the final say. And so I will hope in the thing that I don't yet see. You don't know how you're going to make it through this month financially. You don't know how your marriage is going to make it through this year. And you hope for that which you already don't, for which you don't yet see. See, Christian hope is rooted in a future reality. Christian hope is righteousness in the place of sin. It's life in the place of death. It's glory in the place of suffering. It's peace in the place of dissension. And it's acceptance in the place of shame. Hope doesn't pull you out of this world. It makes you lean in to the future realities that will be heaven on earth. Hope is a call to action. And maybe my favorite description of hope comes from Soren Kierkegaard. I know everybody's does. 
But Soren Kierkegaard said, true hope is a passion for the possible. It brings to mind that verse where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What's possible in Christ? A lot. Christ is the guy who conquered death. Hope is a passion for the possible. And so Jürgen Moltmann, a great theologian, says that we need to watch out for hopelessness. As we put our hope in Christ, we have to watch out for what it looks like to fall into hopelessness and resignation and melancholy. He says that hopelessness doesn't need to look all that dramatic. It can just look like weakness or timidity or weariness or not wanting to be what God requires of us. He says hope need not look desperate. It can look like boredom or resignation. Hope can look like a shrug of the shoulders or going with the flow. Hopelessness often looks like sins of omission, not sins of commission. We're going to take communion in a few minutes here, and we will pray a prayer of confession. And you might know the words of it well, where we pray for the things that we have done and the things we've left undone. The things we've left undone are sins of omission. Sins of omission are a sign of hopelessness. So hope has this multifaceted character. But lastly, it means it looks like remembering. Hoping contradicts reality. It's knowing that God's going to come through, and it's remembering what God has already done. Listen to verse 6, the last verse we'll look at together. It says, My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. From the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. See, he is remembering God from a very difficult place. All of those geographical landmarks we could hack into, but you want the Cliff's Notes version? It's that they represent a place far from God. This psalmist was used to leading worship in the temple, and now he's cut off from that place of God's presence. And he misses it, and he longs to be back with the crowds, raising their hands and shouting songs of worship. But he is in a far off place, and he says, from that dark, distant place, I will remember you. That is what hope looks like, is remembering. See, the call to remember is always a call to act. He doesn't say, I'm just going to sit and fold my hands and think. He says, I'm going to put myself in the best position to remember and hope in you. Jared Wilson says that every time Israel, God's people, is called to remember them, they're called to do things. We are called to remember Yahweh so we can be faithful to him. We're called to remember the commandments so that we keep them. We're called to remember God's wonderful acts so that we praise him for it. We're called to remember God's uh, favor towards us in spite of our lack of righteousness so we can be dependent on him. The call to hope, the call to remember is a call towards right living and right action. It's not just recollecting facts. And that is why all throughout the Old Testament, We'll see comments against hopelessness, but we also see comments against forgetting. Psalm after psalm, line after line in the Old Testament, chastises God's people for forgetting Yahweh and looking to their neighbors and worshiping other gods. Forgetfulness is a sign of hopelessness. And so this morning, I hope that you have found comfort in seeing someone who may be where you are. Someone in a place of darkness and despondency and despair, feeling like they are going back to where they used to find God and they can't find him anymore, and they cry out in remorse for where they are right now. They find themselves destabilized and disoriented and disillusioned and deserted. And in that dark place, and what do they do? They pour out their soul to God. They ask honest, unfiltered questions of God and themselves. And then they put their hope in God. They resolve to praise They remember God's presence and character, and then they act in accordance with what God is like. People that hope carry a passion for the possible, even when they're in that dark, impossible place. So with that on our hearts and minds, let's, as a church, act in hope by celebrating communion together. Will you pray with me? Lord, most merciful God, the God who never forgets us, who always remembers us, the God who has great hope in us. We confess that we've sinned against you in thought and word and deed by what we've done, maybe pridefully going the other way. 
and by what we've left undone, those sins of omission that show signs of our own hopelessness, that things can't ever be better. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And for that, we are truly sorry and we humbly repent. Lord, we want to be people who pour out our soul to you and who put our hope in God. Help us do that for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. And in that, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Well, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and again, once he had given thanks to his Father in heaven for it, he took it and broke it. And he turned and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And again, on that same night, he took a cup of wine, a cup that symbolized the cup of God's wrath that would be drunk to the bottom by him. And he gave thanks to his Father in heaven for it, despite what it represented. And he turned and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink. This is my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So we're going to take communion as uh, the ushers will release you to come uh, up front. If you still want a prepackaged option, that's in the back. We'll be sanitizing before we give you communion. If you are at home, please feel free to be part of communion with us together, getting your own bread and your own cup together. But again, let's celebrate what it is to be people of hope as we remember God and what he's done in his great sacrificial death for us. Which mark 
to celebrate communion together. Let's uh, commit this moment to God with a prayer. Father, we give you thanks that in these moments we can actively pour out our soul to you and put our hope in you. God, we give you thanks that in these moments as well we can hear your words over our lives. You are forgiven. Help us live in light of that. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So a few announcements before we uh, part ways this morning. The first is on July 24th we have a newcomer's lunch. If you're new to the church, we would love to get to know you. It's going to be uh, a lunch downstairs on that day from 12.15 to 1.32-ish. And uh, it's a time to just connect with new people in the church to learn more about it. And uh, a bunch of the staff will be there too. So we hope you make that uh, a priority. You can register on our website. And then we have a special event we'd like to make you aware of as there, there's an open house and a book signing. Uh, one of our elders, Aaron Blackman, has wrote a, a memoir. You, you may know that um, she uh, has dealt with the loss of her son who died by suicide a few years ago. And she's published a book chronically. And it's called My Unexpected Journey, Reflections After Losing My Son to Suicide. So she's going to be doing a book signing on Thursday, July 7th. So coming up quick at Atlas Art, the place of another person in our church. And, um, and she'll you know, have access. You can uh, meet her if you haven't met her and have her sign uh, your book if you haven't done that yet. But um, she is a wonderful person to speak to exactly what we talked about this morning, lamenting when things are not how you'd want them to be. So I hope you make that a priority too. Well, again, on this beautiful 4th of July, July weekend, would you mind standing and receiving the benediction as we close our time together? It's this. When you find yourself in the dark night of the soul, may you pour out your soul to God and may you put your hope in him. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning.